Welcome back, everybody. So today, we're going to continue putting the plan that we came up with into action, uh, the plan to get our hands on the true area of a region that's not just some nice geometric shape that we have a formula for. Right? And our plan was to once again bust out the motto of calculus and to approximate this area and then take a limit. Right. And our idea to approximate these areas uh, was to use rectangles. Right. So we were looking at this particular area, this integral, uh, last time. And using four rectangles, all right, we stood them up and got our heights from our right endpoints to start. And then we said, hey, well, why don't we, uh, instead of using the right endpoints, we could use the midpoints if we wanted. And we could stand up rectangles and get some slightly different heights. And if we add up the areas of these rectangles, we'll have a reasonable approximation uh, for the area of our, uh, of our, the area that is bounded by our graph, right, between one and three, right, that definite integral. All right, and so over here, this is us working this through, just adding up the areas of each of our rectangles, just uh, taking our width of 0.5, right, and multiplying them by the height given by our function value right, in this case at the midpoints. Well, today we're going to see how we can continue with the model of calculus and put the rest of our plan into action. So let me switch over to our notes for today. So once again, um, our approximation strategy that we came up with was to line up rectangles along the x-axis and get the heights, you know, maybe not from the right endpoints, maybe from the midpoints, maybe from the left endpoints, you know, whatever, uh, just from some choice of uh, points um, on each rectangle's base. All right, send those through our function to get our height. It's a little bit of terminology. Um, such a approximation, adding up these areas of rectangles, is called a Riemann sum. Uh, so yeah, re, not Ryman, <laughs> Riemann uh, sum in honor of a rock star mathematician, Riemann, from ways back. All right. But anyways, if we introduce a little bit of notation, we can write down truly what we mean by a definite integral. All right, and the idea is, well, how do we make our approximation to our area better, right? Well, if we were using four rectangles, well, how about we use 10? How about we use 200? How about we use a trillion? How about we use a Google, right? Et cetera, more boxes, right? And so the idea is, well, that if we decide to call a Riemann sum with N rectangles, capital RS sub N, well, then we can write down exactly what we mean by a definite integral. All right, it's going to be the limit of these Riemann sums as n, right, our number of boxes, goes to infinity. And so here with this definition, uh, we have a precise mathematical way of defining these definite integrals, our areas that we care about. And that's great, and that makes us happy, but we also want to be able to compute these. And in order to start computing these, we need to first figure out how we can write an n rectangle Riemann sum. So let's think about that. All right, so let's start off with just a four rectangle Riemann sum, like what we had with when we were doing our midpoints, right? There's, um, let me not flip back. Uh, let me just continue here, right? The uh, basic structure we had, right, is we had our width of our rectangle, 0.5, times the height of our rectangle, right, which we got by taking the midpoint from our first, you know, little subinterval 
um, right, the first base of our rectangle and plug it into our function, right? Let me flip back over now, right? This was this right here. This is what we're describing, right? The 0.5 times our function evaluated at our first, you know, midpoint of our first subinterval here, right? From one to one and a half. All right, but then we're gonna have a very similar term for all the others, right? So let me, let me flip back. Right, so we have f of our midpoint of the second subinterval times the width plus the function evaluated at the midpoint of the third subinterval times 0.5 and etc. Right, over to our fourth rectangle's area as well. All right, well, written like this, we, we can start seeing what it would look like uh, to write down an n rectangle Riemann sum, right? Where we're not specifying what n is. Maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's a thousand, maybe it's a trillion, etc. Right? Each one of these terms, these areas of rectangles, is going to have our width times our function value, right? At some input. Right? And so to start off, right, we might not be using midpoints. Maybe we're using right endpoints or left endpoints or whatever. But whatever point we plug into our function, it's going to be some x value, right? Well, so why don't we introduce some notation? Since it's an x value, let's use x. And since this point is going to come from our first subinterval, well, let's include that with a subscript, say sub one, right? So an X value from our first sub interval. And next, let's make it pretty and toss in a star up top. Doesn't that look nice? That's for real. Uh, that star is <laughs> an official part of the notation. All right. All right, so with um, n boxes, right, our width is probably not going to be 0.5. It's going to be something um, because it's a you know stretch of x values. We like to use this delta x or change in x to represent the width. All right. So there's our area for our first rectangle, right? And we're going to have something very similar for the second, the third, all the way down to, right, the last one is going to be the nth, right, since we have n rectangles. So we can uh, toss those terms in here, right, f of x2 star, right, whatever that um, point is that we're using from the base of the second rectangle, right, plug that into our function times our width. And similarly for the third rectangle and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, all the way up to whatever the nth is. That's our last rectangle area we'll toss in. So a little bit of terminology here. Uh, these x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, uh, these are called evaluation points. Let me see if I can just write this in here. Yeah, I'll do it with uh, quotes as we are introducing a term here, evaluation points. Right? They're just the points. You know what the base of our rectangles that we plug into our function, right, to get the heights of our rectangles. Right? Maybe these evaluation points are midpoints, like they were in our last example. Maybe they're right endpoints. Whatever. So a couple of notes about this. First of all, I claim we can come up with a formula uh, for the width of each of these rectangles. Right, so here's the idea. If we have a stretch uh, from, from A to B, right, that we're integrating, right, grab an area over. Well, if this 
interval has some length. Let me call it L. Well, if we're fitting four rectangles into this interval, well, then the width of each one of them is going to have to be this length divided by four. Similarly, if we're wanting to fit n rectangles into the stretch, well, then we're going to have to take the length of a to b and divide that by n, right? And that will be the width of each one of our rectangles. In other words, right, b minus a over n is our formula for the width of each rectangle, delta x. Right, just because b minus a is how we can capture the length of that interval. Right? For example, if a was 2 and b was 10, well, then this length would be 8, right? 10 minus 2. So we have a nice formula for our width of our rectangles. The second thing I want to show us is that there's a nice compact way to write this sum that saves us from writing out all these different terms individually. The observation is that with, with each term, there's a lot that's the same. Right? Each one of these terms uh, has some function evaluated at a point times delta x. Right? And actually looking at each one of these terms, right? the function is the same, it's f, the delta x is the same, the only thing that's changing is what's inside our function. Right? And the first thing, it's x1 star, and the second, it's x2 star, and the third, it's x3 star, and down the line. Well, to represent that, we could say that it's kind of how the, the general kind of form of what we're adding up looks like this. It's f of xi star times delta x, right, for some different values of i, right? i is 1 at the start, and then 2, then 3, all the way up to n. So the way that we can write down in a compact way, well, hey, let's add up all these terms from i equals 1 to n is with summation notation. So we this big symbol is a Greek sigma for sum. And so we're going to add up all these terms, starting from i equals 1 and then stopping when i equals n. All right, so this is called summation notation. I want to introduce it now. Uh, we are going to come back to it and make use of it. It makes our computations a lot cleaner. But I think it's important for us to work through our first example without summation notation so we could really see what's going on. We understand what's going on under the hood when we reintroduce summation notation and see how it helps us. All right. So with that in mind, let's look at our first integral computation where we'll use this definition. All right, let's compute the integral from 0 to 2 of x cubed using a limit of Riemann sums. Right, and let's use right endpoints as our evaluation points. All right, and so this is an area. And right, if we were to graph it x cubed, right, it looks something like this. We're looking at the area from 0 to 2. It's something like this. This is the area we're looking at. <laughs> um, it's not a nice triangle or rectangle or even a quarter of a circle or anything like that. It's its own thing. And so here, we get to bring in our motto of calculus and, and use it to find this area. Right? From our definition, right, our... Uh, definite integral is equal to our oops, limit as n goes to infinity of our Riemann sum with n rectangles. All right, and using uh, what we uh, wrote down just a, a moment ago, right, our general way of writing a Riemann sum with n boxes, we can kind of copy paste that down here. Have f of x1 star times our width plus f of x2 tar times delta x all the way up through the nth area of our rectangle. 
All right, so we have to start filling things in. And by the way, <laughs> it's gonna take a lot of work. Um, there's gonna be a lot of writing, uh, a lot of algebra, and even a limit at infinity at the end to look forward to, all right? But we can do it, just walk through step by step. And tomorrow, we'll be able to see how summation notation will actually streamline our work quite a bit. But so to start, <clears throat> let's uh, think about our evaluation points and our width delta x. And so to start, we can get a little uh, zoomed in version of this interval we're thinking about from zero to two. All right, and so with n rectangles, our delta x using our formula from above, right, is gonna be b minus a over n. Well, here our our a is zero and our b is two. So our formula turns into two minus zero over n. In other words, two over n is the width of each one of our rectangles. And it might feel a little bit funny to have an n involved, but I claim that this makes sense because the width is gonna depend on n, the number of rectangles. Right, if we're using four rectangles, um, we're gonna have a wider width than if we were using a trillion rectangles, right? When our rectangles would be much, much thinner. Okay, so now we know what each of our delta x's equals. Now we just need to figure out our evaluation points, x1 star, x2 star, all the way up through xn star. All right, but these are our right endpoints. All right, so here's the thought, here's the thought. Our first rectangle has a width of two over n, all right? There's its width, two over n, and so if that's true, then where is that first right endpoint going to be? What's the x value of this first right endpoint? Well, it's going to be 2 over n, right? Um, right? With uh, If 2 over n was, I don't know, like a, a half, let's just say it was a half again, um, well then, if we bump over by a half, well then, starting at zero, moving over by a half, will lead us at a half. And so here, yeah, two over n is going to be our first right endpoint. Right? Two over n. Right? In other words, right, this is our x1 star, a first evaluation point. All right. Well, what about x2 star, right, our second right endpoint? Right, our second rectangle has the same width, 2 over n. All right, so what's the second right endpoint going to be? Well, it's going to be you know, 2 times 2 over n, right? We went over 2 over n, then we're going to go going to go over another 2 over n. All right, so let, let me uh, write it like this. Uh, 2 times 2 over n. And that's our x2 star. All right, and we can kind of see the pattern now, right? Our third right endpoint, well, we're going to go over another 2 over n. And so that's 3 times 2 over n. And notice I'm not simplifying the numerator. That's on purpose for sure. Um, it's going to help make certain things, certain work that we're going to do cleaner to see if we actually don't simplify our numerators and just keep these as 2 times 2, two 3 times 2. Right? And so again, um, our, right, our x3 star is going to be 3 times 2 over n. 
and so on and so forth. And so with that, we can fill in uh, these missing pieces over here in our expression. Whoops, <laughs> that was more than I thought. Um, so let's talk about this. <laughs> okay, so x1 star, right? This is 2 over n. Uh, we want to plug that in to our function, right? But what's our function? Well, if we look back at our integral, our function is x cubed, right? There's our f of x. And so we were, we're wanting to take 2 over n and plug it into our function. Well, our function is just going to take 2 over n and cube it, right? So that's what we see here. Here's our x1 star plugged into our function. Similarly, x2 star, all right, that's our 2 times 2 over n. If we plug that into our function, it'll get cubed. And so here's our 2 times 2 over n cubed. Similarly, 3 times 2 over n cubed. It's our third evaluation point plugged into our function. And then all right, our last evaluation point, xn star, that's going to be n times 2 over n. A little sanity check there. Uh, notice that the n's would cancel, and we're left with 2, which we like looking at our interval. Right, Our very last right endpoint should indeed be 2. All right, So this is us plugging that into our function. Ends up getting cubed. And then these 2 over n's on the right-hand side. All right, those are just our delta x's that we found, our 2 over n's. All right. So, have some work to do. Uh, one thing we might do at the start um, is take these cubes and distribute them. Um, exponents, right, do not distribute over addition or subtraction, but they happily distribute over multiplication and division. And so we can take these cubes and break them apart with what we see here. All right, so we get two cubed over n cubed, 2 cubed, 2 cubed over n cubed, and 3 cubed, 2 cubed over n cubed, and n cubed, 2 cubed over n cubed, all over here. All right. So at this point, maybe throw up in our mouths just a little bit. <laughs> but then we let that pass, and we get to work, right? Uh, okay. Okay. So one thing we might do looking at this, and you probably noticed already, um, there, there's some stuff that's in common uh, to each one of these terms. All right? There's the 2 over n for sure. But also, uh, I claim that there's a 2 cubed over n cubed in each of these as well. Um, so we have this uh, common factor that we can pull out of every single one of these terms. I didn't say this explicitly earlier, but let me clarify this now. This dot, dot, dot in the middle, right? this is just telling us that, yes, we're going to continue this pattern up until you know, we get to this last term. But each one of these terms, even that we don't see, is going to have this. We can pull it out front. And what's going to be left, right? in our second term, we've got 2 cubed, then 3 cubed, then it'll be 4 cubed, 5 cubed, all the way up to n cubed. And... Uh, we'll just have a 1 at the start. All right, so there we go. There is this common factor that we pulled out and what we have left over. All right, now it doesn't look so bad. But, you know, what's the limit of this thing as n goes to infinity? Well, it's hard to say. And, and, and a big reason why is we've got... Uh, this ever-increasing sum, right? When n is 4, we're going to be adding up 4 things. When n is 10, we're adding up 10 things. When, when n is a trillion, we're adding up a trillion things. And so we have this ever-increasing sum. And how do we deal with that? Well, um, people have thought about sums like this. The sum has a nice form. If we want to, we can this 1 we can write it, think of as 1 cubed. 
And so we can think of this as the sum of the first n cubes. And people have asked, well, is there a nice way to write this? Is sort of some formula? And happily for us, there is. And so at this point, we really need um, a formula to our rescue. And here it is. Right, the sum of the first n cubes we can write actually in this nice compact form as n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. And maybe at this point, let's maybe just take a moment and sanity check this. Right? Is this even giving us something true? Well, let's do... You know, one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed and, and see if this formula is telling us truth All right well in this case right our n the last thing that we're adding is three and so our formula is telling us that this should equal you know three squared times three plus one squared so four squared over four. And well, let's think about this. Well, one plus eight plus 27 is nine plus 27, which is 36, All right? So just adding these things up on the left, we get 36. Over on the right, do we get the same thing? Well, we're gonna have nine times, well, this 4 will cancel off with one of the 4s up top. Ah. Indeed, they match. All right, what this formula is showing us is that this will match if we're adding up the first 3 cubes or first 4 cubes or first 5 cubes. However many cubes we add up, we can always write it in this nice compact way. So we can take this formula now and take this big, ugly, ever-increasing sum and swap it out with this nice, compact, closed form expression. And this will allow us to continue our work and actually compute our limit. All right, so swapping that in there. We get what we see here. And at this point, you know, with this substitution we've made, we can now start to think about, okay, you know, we got something involving n. How do we actually compute um, a limit as n goes to infinity? I know we haven't used n's before. We've thought about x's, but that's fine. Right? How do we compute a limit at infinity? Well, this is actually going back to our very first experience with limits, right? We had our limit law infinity, right? That one over x to some power, that limit as x goes to infinity or minus infinity is zero. And so our idea was to make those types of things show up, well, we want to take powers of x and pull them out, right? Specifically, we want to pull out the highest powers of n, in our case, from the top and the bottom let some things cancel. We should have some, you know, uh, one over x, or in our case, one over n to some powers that we can work with. All right, so let's come over here. Let's do a little bit of algebra first. Maybe let's get our um, n stuff kind of all together on the right and bring our four out here with the other constant multiples. Um, so doing that, just kind of swapping these, right, and things are multiplied, so this is fine. We get what we see here. Now a little bit of canceling is going to happen. All right, um, this four down at the bottom is going to cancel off with uh, two of the factors up two up top. Uh, so we'll get left with two squared, or just four, outside. And then uh, this n squared, uh, that's going to cancel off with two of the n's down below. And we'll be left with uh, what we see here. Now, let's use our strategy, right? Let's uh, 
Well, in the bottom, just an n squared, we can pull that out pretty quickly. Um, up top, we got this squared outside to deal with. So let's, I, I suppose, deal with that, distribute that out. Uh, we're going to get n squared plus 2n plus 1. We figure out n plus 1 times n plus 1. Now, let's use our strategy up top. We can pull out an n squared. In the bottom, we can pull out an n squared. All right, now those n squareds will happily cancel. And we see what we're left with. And indeed, uh, we have a bunch of you know one or some number over some powers of n that we can work with. And I'm just realizing. Uh, let me mention real quick. So right when we pull out the n squared, we have to do it from all three terms. Right, so we'll be left with, um, you know, two n divided by n squared gives us two over n, and one divided by n squared gives us the one over n squared here. All right, and now we can take the limit. Right, these terms are both going to be head into zero. So then what we get is nice clean four. Whew. All right, all right. Um, a lot of work, a lot of work. Um, we can do it, right? Using our our way of writing an n rectangle Riemann sum, figuring out our width and our valuation points, plugging those in, all right? Using our formula, you know, this type of formula is key, and you know, for any of these computations, will be supplied <laughs> definitely. Uh, these formulas are uh, a key part of getting our kind of function into a form that we can deal with and compute the limit of. All right, so a little bit of a victory lap here after all of our work. So what we've just seen here in terms of area, right, is that this, this area here from 0 to 2 underneath the graph of x cubed is a nice, clean 4 units squared. And this is a new area for us, right? This isn't just a triangle or a rectangle or, you know, a fraction of a circle. Um, this is a brand new area that we've computed using our motto of calculus. So as a final uh, victory lap, uh, let's actually see this kind of playing out for us in Desmos. Stand by. See if I can log in. All right, let's look at our function um, x cubed. I had an hour a was zero. Our b was 2. You know what? Let me. Uh... Get a little bit better visual for us. There we go. All right. So, what we can see here as I slide this, this n is the number of rectangles that we'd be using, right? So, this would be our terrible approximation if all we were using was run one rectangle. All right, n equals 2 would look like that. n equals 3 would look like this. And so on. If we slide this over, more and more rectangles, well, then we're going to be doing a better and better job of approximating the true area. All right, and as we slide this up up to you know, 100, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell. You can see a little bit of choppiness. But uh, notice 
here, I think we can actually see this is us adding up um, our areas of our rectangles, right? This is the summation notation, right? And so a little bit over four, right? And so here we can kind of see, you know, visually, yeah, we were going to have an overestimate uh, at each point along the way. But, right, as we use more and more rectangles, our estimate's going to be getting better and better and closer and closer to the true value. And with our work, we legitimately computed what this limit is to this process, right? And it's four. Good work today, everyone. Tomorrow we'll get to see how summation notation can streamline things for us and make our life a little bit better. I'll see you then.